So what does it take to get 802.1x up and running? Uh, it sounds exciting, I hope. <laughs> Actually stopping and saying, who goes there? You uh, Having a door guy at the perimeter of our network authenticating each and every device. Uh, I'd explain that maybe to non-technical neighbors and they would think, of course, isn't that how a network works? And then you think, oh gosh, no. You know, Fortune 100 companies, uh, you know, institutes that should know a lot better, there's a good chance you can attach that network and it will just work without you doing anything. And that's frightening. So we say, well, what can we do to make our environment a bit more secure? And we say, well, it's great to focus on firewalls. It's great to focus on the edge. It's great to do some stuff with cloud security. But what's happening on premises? What's happening at the actual switch port? And a lot of times, the answer is not much. So we can take our existing infrastructure. Uh, this has been supported on Catalyst switches for, geez, probably the last 10 years, if not more. Um, it's widely supported. It's on all the operating systems it's built in, and it's going to make your environment so much more secure. Uh, again, if we can understand this on the wired side, you can also deploy it on the wireless side, and this is what we call enterprise-grade WPA2. Um, not to talk about the wireless quite yet, but remember with wireless, uh, WPA2 pre-shared keys can be broken uh, in a very trivial matter using air crack. Uh, 802.1x in enterprise mode can't be broken. So when we look at that, we go, oh, we've got something that's trivial to break versus something that pretty much isn't. And we go, yep, you just need a radio server. Most companies throw their head in the air and they go with that pre-shared key. So we wanna make sure fewer and fewer people are doing that. I hope watching these videos helps get you pumped up and ready to deploy this. Um, let's look at the wired solution and then we'll take a look at wireless. So starting off on the authenticator, remember that there's three parties, the supplicant, the authenticator, and the authentication server, sometimes called your AAA server or radius server. Uh, could be ICE, just, could just be Active Directory, could be Open LDAP or whatever. Uh, the supplicant is our user, the authenticator, Again, this could be a switch, it could be a firewall, and what else could it be? If you're thinking wireless access point, you're absolutely right. Um, again, these are our doorkeepers. They say, hey, who goes there when you come in the network? Without 802.1x, we're just letting anybody in off the streets. So as the supplicants come in, we need to authenticate them. Well, again, one of the prerequisites to this is gonna be a radius server. There's a few workarounds for Soho where people will try to implement a local radio server and then connect to it over loopback um, and then say that you don't need something external. But this really is a requirement for getting .1x up and running. Um, just plan on having it. We configure our global AAA settings, which basically says turn it on with the AAA new model command. And then we can use some AAA lists to define what it is that needs to be authenticated. Uh, we'll configure some global radius settings. You'll define your radius servers. Let's say that we've got two of them, right? Redundancy. We'll put the two servers into one group, and then that one group is what all of our devices will reference. They can try one, then the other. If your devices are new enough to support change of authorization, just a couple extra configuration steps, and now our network can dynamically react to updates and changes in real time. This is opposed to waiting until a user logs out and then catching them next time. So it puts our most current policies into action immediately. Additionally, remember that Radius has got the ability to return Radius AV pairs. Look at the different vendors that you use. I try to keep everything Cisco. I, I'd say put everything under the Cisco umbrella. I was saying that long before OpenDNS. Um, but you know, here we are, we've got all these different products that we want to kind of interact with. Everything that Cisco does within their documentation, I believe that you'll find to be um, extremely straightforward. It's well documented. Uh, that may or may not work or be the case with some other vendors. You know, your mileage may vary. But realize, you know, whoever those other vendors are, if you're trying to tie them into ICE, if you're trying to get it to work with your switches, um, Radius is an open standard. And these AV pairs, as we call them, are well documented. So each of the pairs are the things that you're describing like a VLAN. It'll have a code number to it, and that code number means something. It means you know first name, last name, street address. Those are all attributes. And of course, the values are the, the things that we would fit in there. So we define the attributes that are important for our environment. If you've got you know F5, if you've got uh, you know some other vendor that, that you're trying to integrate, 
each of those other vendors is going to have their attributes. So we figure out what the attributes are, uh, and we return them, and it works just fine. All the pieces merge together really nicely. If we want to have a better idea of who's attached to our switches, we can turn on device tracking. Uh, we can globally enable 802.1x. And then on the interfaces, we set up .1x, MAB, FlexAuth, uh, the mode of implementation. If we want to force things or adjust timers for re-authentication, what host mode are we in? What's going on with critical and restricted VLANs? Again, all parameters that we would set. So walking through these, um, the first command, you know, if you do AAA question mark, you may not see a whole lot. And that's because AAA hasn't really been enabled yet. Once we enable AAA with AAA new model, come back and do a AAA question mark before, do a AAA question mark after. And you'll see that once this has been turned on, that we've got all sorts of new features available. Um, the three that should jump out at you the most are AAA authentication, AAA authorization, and AAA accounting. And what they're showing you here is called a method list. And a method list describes how to authenticate users given a certain method of connectivity. So for example, AAA authentication dot one X, which is our whole conversation, we say by default, use group ICE. ICE is the name of our server group, and then within the server group, there's gonna be multiple servers. Each one perhaps defined by IP address, and it would represent ICE server A, ICE server B, ICE server C. And you authenticate somebody and we go, hey, who goes there? They give us a username and password, fantastic. All right, you're in. We may not do anything else, but just authenticate them. But if you wanna be a little bit more intelligent, we can actually do some authorization. This ties into things like downloadable VLAN assignments, where we can dynamically change the port's VLAN. Ties into things like downloadable access control lists, turns into things like MACSEC policies. Uh, there's a lot of parameters that we can push down to the switch or access point to tell it how to handle that particular user session. And of course, the accounting records. We want to have logs of what this user did, not only for troubleshooting, but just for crime. <laughs> you know, lots of good reasons. So AAA accounting.1x is going to show us who was logged in, for how long. Um, and then we can, of course, dump that into some type of database and then dig through that database looking for anomalies. Who's logging in at weird hours? Who's having lots of failed attempts? Things like that. So here we are uh, defining a radius server. We say radius server ICE. That's the name of the particular server. And we say the address is IP version 4. Here's the IP. Next, we have the auth port and the accounting port. Let's talk about this for a quick second. Remember that radius uses not TCP, but UDP. Take that U and remember UDP and remember users, right? Where TACX Plus was more for administrators and TCP based. Uh, TACX Plus uses TCP port 49 each and every time. It's simple. Uh, Radius is going to be a bit dodgier. Uh, here, it's going to use 1645 for authentication and authorization. And accounting actually happens on a different port. It's like a slightly different service that's listening on a slightly different port. Uh, and these are the two numbers that you'll see. 1645 and 1646 were used for many, many years, but they're considered legacy, which is another way of saying old and deprecated. Um, in older solutions, we would listen on 1645 and 1646. On newer solutions, they say 1812 and 1813. The reason for that, not to make your lives more complicated, um, is just simply that there was a conflict on these other ports. These were basically registered or reserved uh, by some other entity that's insignificant. Um, that conflict, however, was enough for the good folks at Radius to say, oh, you know what, you were here first. Our, my bad, let me get up and move. And they moved their ports over to 1812 and 1813, which was a polite gesture. Uh, but the problem is inner, uh, the access control list that you'll find in between an authenticator, and an authentication server. Remember the authenticators, things like switches, wireless access points, et cetera. Think about all the different places you'll have switches throughout your environment. Um, you could have switches in your DMZ. You could have switches on the dirty side, like outside the outside interface of your firewall. Are you still going to have centralized authentication? How are you going to tie into it? Um, when we look at that access point of the authenticator that we're going to try to log into, it has to pass radius traffic to the authentication server. 
So the intermediate devices between an authenticator, which could just be a switch or AP, and the ICE server, just, so just imagine other potential switches, routers, firewalls, APs, if they're filtering, we want to think about 1645 and 1646. There's a lot of devices out there, especially non-Cisco non ones, that'll still, even in the year 2020, try to default to these. They shouldn't. Everything should be on 1812 and 1813. This has been the case for years, but it doesn't mean that everybody does. So what happens is you'll be out there in the field doing a deployment, and for some reason, Radius isn't working. Why not? Because the actual message type is blocked. If ICMP is allowed, you're going to be able to ping that server no problem. But your Radius traffic isn't going to go through. And by the nature of Radius, you know, UDP is typically pretty difficult to verify. With UDP, it's easy, uh, TCP, it's easy. I can send a SYN. There's a TCP ping that you can use in Linux and OSX. And I'll just do TCP ping to a port like 443 or 80, and I know it's up. Even if ping is blocked, I can just send a SYN real quick. I can't do that on UDP. So this is harder to verify, and it's something where you're, I don't want to say likely, but if we contrast this with TCP 49, which we've only got one port opposed to two, and it's always the same way with Tactics Plus, well, over here we've got two different ports, depending on what's going on, ultimately four. So just things to think about uh, when configuring intermittent ACLs. Another th neat thing you can do with this is we can do automated testing. So with automate tester, and they do a username of dummy, uh, ignore account port. This basically just says don't test the accounting port and try to log into that, but log into the lower port, 1812. And basically we're just gonna use this dummy account to keep authenticating. And all we're doing is testing and making sure that that AAA server is up and usable and, and that he's responding as he should. Um, if he's not responding, we can fail over to another unit. Sometimes that takes a bit of time, and your users will notice and they'll complain. So we can tweak these timers if it would become more appropriate for your organization. Uh, again, when we create server groups, here we say AAA group server, and here they gave the, the group the same name as the individual server. I try to break this up. I'd say like IS underscore group and then the individual server name of like IS1, IS2, IS3, IS4. Um, but the way that this effectively works is we set up our group, we put the members into it, and then we can use this group name within our authentication method list. That is what we saw happening back here. This is that method list. So we say, hey, switch, when someone's trying to do dot one x authentication, look here. What's that? It's going to be that particular server at 10.64.0.100. If you want to support dynamic authorization, here's the command to do that. Uh, in order to send vendor-specific attributes, these are abbreviated VSA. Whenever you hear that term, don't get intimidated by it. Um, the codes, see how they're like radius server attribute 6, attribute 8, attribute 25. These are fairly well-defined. So whatever it is that you're working with, I think Cisco's the king of documentation, but say that we're working on some other vendor. Um, they're going to have these as well. It's, it's all documented. You can Google for the codes. And then basically, we'll just tell our devices that when you're interacting with these types of components, set these attributes, uh, which are basically requesting these values. These are the things that will be included with our authentication requests. To enable IP device tracking, uh, that's easy enough. And basically, all it's going to do is an ARP to make sure that each of the clients that was connected is still connected. And if somebody's disconnected, we can learn that sooner than later. Here we are globally enabling .1x. .1x system auth control turns it on across the board. Still, we have to turn it on on individual ports. Before you do that, you can create an access list to say this is what's permitted before people authenticate. Again, used for low impact mode. What's closed mode do? It says no access until you authenticate. As far as the interface specific settings, got a description. We've moved it from a dynamic port to an access port. Statically configured it in VLAN 10, configured port fast, and here we are applying an access uh, list called pre-auth inbound on this interface. Now this isn't all of it. Um, additionally, on your interface, you're going to say authentication, 
it will specify open, closed, authentication port control, auto. Now again, you can manually open and close ports, but the whole idea of 802.1x is people will authenticate. Um, the authentication, we can do periodic re-authentication where we ask them to authenticate once again. And again, this just makes sure that they didn't walk away from their system, somebody else didn't sit down and hop in that doesn't know the password. Now they're kind of just wandering through our environment without any type of um, regulation occurring. This periodic reauthentication is going to allow us to come in there and just make sure that it is somebody that's trusted. Uh, additionally, this port could be supporting not only a, a supplicant or a workstation, it could also support a phone. So a lot of times in that scenario, where it's like a hybrid port doing both data and voice, uh, we can configure it for such. In this case, we see description IP phone plus PC, switch port voice, VLAN 40. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, a lot of times the way that this will work, uh, here's our switch port. Yes, this is our switch port. Uh, coming over to the switch, and what we typically do within the cubicle is we take the phone and we attach the phone. And using CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol, there's some negotiations for how much power it needs. There's negotiations about um, quality of service markings, there's negotiations about a voice VLAN, but basically this phone is smart enough that through CDP, it learns that it belongs in VLAN 40. And it'll put a tag on its own traffic. Like when that phone does DHCP, it's gotta do DHCP, it'll learn for, like where does it get its firmware. Um, before it does DHCP, it wants to learn what VLAN it goes in. It learns that through CDP. And then once we know we're in VLAN 40, we can do a DHCP request tag it with VLAN 40, that comes into the switch. Of course, we hit the appropriate server for VLAN 40, which the DHCP option will give us a TFTP server so that we can pull down our bin image. Pretty cool, this is like a whole separate side conversation that the PC that's attached to the wire knows nothing about. So let's say that this is our laptop. When we do a DHCP request, that's just gonna pass through. It doesn't necessarily need any tag. Even if we do EPOL, and we authenticate, we still don't need to tag our own traffic. So it's kind of funny that you'll see the voice over IP traffic tagged, the uh, non-voice traffic or data traffic untagged, but this is just the way that it works. Uh, again, you've got your commands there uh, for doing the host mode, notice that it's multi-domain. Um, you can also change the priority there in the order. Notice that it's .1x and MAB, but we can change those orders around. And that's just what they call flex authentication.